Hi, you're listening to The Sociology Show, a podcast about absolutely anything to do with the wonderful world of sociology. Whether you're a teacher, a lecturer, a student, or just taking a passing interest, this podcast will look at a range of issues from social class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, crime, education, and anything else that sociology has to offer. My name is Matthew Wilkin, and each episode I will speak to someone working in the field of sociology and let them explain all about their own interests, their research, and their experiences. So, put your earphones in, turn the volume up, and let's be sociology geeks together, eh? Hello and welcome to The Sociology Show. This podcast is sponsored by Collins, high quality student books, teacher guides, an unbeatable value revision for GCSE and A-level sociology. Sociology Show listeners can get 25% off Collins sociology resources, and that includes the new book, How to Be a Sociologist, an inspiring introduction to studying sociology at A-level and at university. If you're interested in taking up this offer, then please do head to collins.co.uk forward slash sociology show and enter the code sociology show at the checkout. Out. The Sociology Show podcast is also brought to you in association with Tutor to You Sociology, the exam performance specialist for A level and GCSE sociology students and teachers. And so you can visit their website, which is tutor to you net forward slash sociology and there you can pick up revision guides flashcards revision videos and everything else that you need for your a level or gcse sociology studies and so my guest for this episode is dr lexi stadlin so without further ado let's go over to the interview hi thank you very much for coming on the sociology show podcast do you want to start by telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do yeah sure uh, so my name is lexi and I am an anthropologist and an ethnographer and a writer. Uh, and I have recently published my first book, which is called Nine Paths. And it was based on the field research that I did as part of my PhD in social anthropology at the LSE which involved uh, studying the lives, the intimate lives of Muslim women living in rural India. Thank you, Lexi. And I'm always intrigued how, how people got into that. I mean, <laughs> it seems quite random, <laughs> a little bit off the beaten track. How did you end up in India uh, researching this group? So I think I had a reasonably cliched first response to India when I went uh, as a tourist uh, long before I went to do research there and I just loved it instantly um, and just found it constantly fascinating and surprising and totally overwhelming and therefore really, really interesting. So when I decided to go back and do a master's in anthropology, I sort of knew that if I was ever going to pursue a PhD, it would always be focused on India and it was when I started to look into things in India more closely, I became really interested in the Muslim population, um, particularly given what is going on there politically at the moment, where you have a, um, a BJP government led by Modi, who is uh, a head of a party that is sort of at best very pro uh, the Hindutva agenda and at worst is sort of uh, quite discriminatory against the Muslim community. So the thought of looking at the Muslim population and particularly women who often aren't considered simply because anthropologists are often men or whoever is doing the research is often male and therefore doesn't get access to those spaces and those communities was something that I thought would be particularly fascinating. Thank you, thank you. And th the area that you're looking at is, is quite rural, quite remote, is that right? It was uh, very rural. So it's about three and a half hours drive from Kolkata in West Bengal. And it was on an island, uh, the, one of the first islands in a group that are called the Sundarbans, which is a conjunction of the Bengali words uh, Sunda and Ban, which is beautiful forests. And they're part of the world's largest mangrove forests. Um, it straddles this huge area uh, crossing the border between India and Bangladesh. And it's this 
really extraordinary, evocative landscape um, composed of lots and lots of different islands whose edges are kind of constantly being reshaped by the, the tides. Um, there is kind of dense forest on some of the islands that are uninhabited, uh, which are also home to uh, Bengal tigers. And it's this part of India that has the reputation for being uh, a little bit magical, a little bit esoteric, uh, where the boundaries between Hindus and Muslims are perhaps a little bit less rigid than they might be in other places. And I'm interested to see how they took to you as an anthropologist in the area. Um, I, I, I'm interested to know you're, you're, um, you're, you're white British, is that right? That's right, yes. Yeah. And so, uh, religious yourself as well. I was just interested to know how they, they adopted you for that period of time. <laughs> um, no, so I'm not religious. And actually that was one of the things that I had to think about in terms of positioning myself going into yeah. field work uh, because I had had advice saying you know you should say that you're Christian because it will kind of draw an affinity because that you know being Muslim they actually see Christianity as kind of part of the same you know general uh, kind of pantheon of religions along with Judaism but I actually made the decision to be honest and say that I was agnostic which ended up being really useful because it meant that people felt compelled to explain to me why I should believe in God, which was something I think that I wouldn't have been exposed to if I had said, oh, yes, I'm Christian. Um, in terms of how they took to me, I would say initially people were just slightly perplexed as to why this woman had shown up and was sitting in their houses speaking uh, what was at first very rudimentary Bengali and asking them about their lives, particularly as women who had never really been asked about their lives by anyone before, let alone a complete outsider. Um, and there was a sort of mutual bafflement, but also a mutual interest, which you know, I think through the kind of hallmark of ethnographic fieldwork, which is just you keep going every single day and it gets a little bit easier and the trust grows and the confidence grows and those relationships sort of blossom and develop, uh, which meant that sort of after a few months, I was quite a familiar fixture in the village and people had got used to seeing me wandering around. And I think because I was so much of an outsider and was so removed, I think there is almost a sense of it being easier for you to penetrate things because you don't represent any of the kind of, um, what's the best way to phrase this? So I, being a white British person, I'm not, I don't have a caste. I don't have a class that's familiar to them. And also I wasn't religious. So it meant that I wasn't threatening in terms of any social hierarchy. I was just so completely alien. Whereas I did actually work with a female Muslim research assistant for a little while from Kolkata. And they were quite different in front of her because she was from the city and she was educated and she was Muslim. And so she represented kind of a power structure that they recognized and they were worried about saying things that she might regard as problematic in terms of, uh, I don't know, religion or society or culture. Uh, whereas with me, I think being such an alien and also as an outsider kind of blundering around and being really ignorant as to what was going on a lot of the time meant that people felt quite comfortable being very open and honest with me. Yeah, that's interesting. I was going to use the word alien myself, but you, you just mentioned it. That's really interesting. <laughs> and, and do you want to tell us a little bit of sort of uh, the daily structure of the, the life um, of one of the ladies that you followed, or all the nine ladies? I'm imagining it's very, very traditional in terms of expectations in that part of the world. It is. I mean, you know, they come from a rural, dwelling, socially conservative Muslim community. 
So in lots of ways, the options that they have are massively curtailed by those factors. So large numbers of the women in the village are married at a very young age. With this particular generation now, things are improving, but a lot of the women that I was working with had been married at 13, 14 years old. So had really never had the chance to become adults before being thrust into this role of a mother and a wife, which is totally all consuming in terms of, you know, the daily grind of domestic labor, um, of child rearing, of running a a home and a family. So in terms of uh, aspiration for themselves, there were real limitations. But what was quite extraordinary was just how unfettered these aspirations were when it came to their children, particularly their daughters. And they were so determined that their children would have a better life than they would and placed a huge emphasis on education and trying to uh, achieve more and to kind of grasp the Indian dream that is, you know, sold Uh, politically to them of development and economic uh, liberalization, which sadly in these kind of rural communities is really yet to show any signs of um, changing lives in any material way. So you mentioned they they wanted uh, a a different future. Did did they see their lives as as oppressive? Um, That's a really good question and one that is probably quite difficult for me to answer because I think it's all that they've ever known and it's also reflected in the communities around them so as Muslim women they didn't have any more kind of restrictions than Hindu women in neighboring villages Um, if anything because economically they are so disadvantaged and because of the kind of social and religious stigma that is quite pervasive in um, bureaucratic structures against Muslim men. It meant that actually the women that I was working with, a lot of them had become the kind of bureaucratic and political gatekeepers for their communities. So they were the ones that were going to the government offices to ask for roads to be built in the village or to try and put their names down for a welfare scheme. So weirdly, they had kind of, Uh, carved out this area that they could get more freedom uh, than their sort of female Hindu counterparts. Um, But in terms of whether they they saw their lives as oppressive, I think they just found their lives hard, which they are, you know, and I think um, poverty is sort of the biggest driver and limitation of what life is like there. And it is just a tightrope walk between survival and destitution. And, you know, this, the first summer I was there, there was a really uh, very heavy monsoon, which decimated crops around the village, which meant for people who relied on farming, they had, their sort of annual income was wiped out. And that is enough. You know, when the, the margin and the safety cushion is so small, not dissimilar to what we've seen in the UK with the effect that COVID has had on lots of people's lives, that when there isn't any kind of safety net, people just fall through. And I think that poverty was really the biggest, most kind of oppressive thing about their lives. Mm. And in that respect as well, um, I might be being quite naive here, but you said it was rural, it was remote. How aware were they of of the wider world, you know, not just within other parts of India, but beyond that as well? So they, through their Islamic faith, they feel a connection to other parts of the world. And they were, within the village, there was a, a mosque which had been built by a reformist Islamic group called the Tablighi Jamaat. Uh, and it's a group that operates globally and it works via a system of pilgrimage where groups of Tablighis go to different villages, towns, and meet with the people there. So they were, via this organization, connected in quite a fascinating way to certainly to Muslim issues around the world. So it was not uncommon. Uh, probably more men than women because they would attend the mosque 
more frequently. But to to ask me, for example, about what was going on in Israel Palestine, which I found mind blowing that they have this connection to these Muslim communities so far away. Um, in terms of kind of more expansive than that and less connected to Islam, they were totally fascinated with what England was like and what my uh, my world was like and what England is like as a country and what, you know, what people ate there and what they did and what kind of houses they lived in. And we sort of would have to come to an agreement that for every one of my questions um, to them, they would get to ask me a question about my life. And so I think through that dialogue, they definitely became more aware. I would also say that uh, recently in the village, they have got mobile phone signal and, you know, mobile phones have massively democratized access to information in a way that has been really interesting. And it means that the kind of older gatekeepers of those rural communities, uh, which were typically sort of politicians or local big men who would sort of control the flow of information or were just the people that could read, so could read the newspapers yeah. Um, they are now no longer the only ones that can find out what is going on in the outside world and who can, you know, women can watch a video on a phone or listen to the radio and therefore they are getting access to information in a way that is really positive and it's, I think, sort of giving them a lot more of a sense of where they belong and also what they can start uh, demanding and aspiring for. The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show. I was intrigued to know what they found most culturally surprising about yourself. Is it the fact that you were a, a single woman <laughs> travelling around anyway? But I, ju I just wondered if there was something that really kind of shocked uh, shocked them in, in, in particular. I think they were um, quite perturbed that my husband was letting me live there by myself. Yeah. So yeah. whilst I was undertaking the research, my husband, who at the time was actually my fiancé, um, was living in Mumbai working and I was in West Bengal and they found it totally perplexing that both he and my family had agreed to let me do what I was doing and they also were at pains to tell me I think that I was 27 and 28 when I was undertaking my research that I was seriously old and very much over the hill and really needed to crack on with having some children because um, basically I was heading towards old age uh, without having fulfilled this sort of primary obligation. So I would say that was probably the thing that they couldn't really get their heads around, just the why I was permitted to be there in the first place. Um, but also I think why I was interested in their lives, because, you know, as I said before, these are people who have never been asked their opinions, have never been told that their stories are interesting or that their lives are interesting or that what they have to say matters in any significant way. So that was initially very challenging in terms of getting them to talk to me and to open up to me because asking their opinion on anything, they would say, oh, you should go and talk to the imam or, oh, you should go and, you know, ask the, the panchayat leader as opposed to sort of saying, well, this is what I think. And it took a long time for me to sort of say, no, actually, I want to know what you think. And then eventually they would open up and it was always fascinating. And once you built that rapport, Lexi, was was there anything that kind of stands out, maybe a couple of examples of, of the most revealing things you think you heard over your 16 months time there? Uh, most revealing things. So I would say uh, the presence of jinn, Islamic spirits, was something that it took me about nine, ten months to really become aware of. And it was 
this thing that had been kind of hiding in plain sight of me for the whole time. And as soon as I started to ask people about it, everyone had experiences and um, had been unfortunate enough to be, I, I should probably explain at this point what gin are. So gin are, um, it's, it, the word genie comes from gin and they are mentioned in the Quran and they're regarded as um part of Allah's creation. So Allah created humans from earth, angels from light and jinn from fire. And they're these sort of otherworldly beings that are regarded as having very similar lives to humans, but theirs are kind of more fantastical and extraordinary. So they can run at incredible speeds and they can fly on the wind uh, and perform these kind of incredible feats. Crucially, they can see us, but we can't see them. Uh, and just like humans, there are good jinn and there are bad jinn, and the bad jinn have the ability to catch us and possess us. So this was uh, something that, you know, for the first nine months of my field work, I was totally oblivious to. And then it was only after people, I think, started to feel comfortable enough talking about it to me that... I became aware that jinn were everywhere in the village and that all the families had experiences with them. And then ultimately um, someone close, someone who married into one of the families I was working with uh, became possessed, as did one of the nine women that the book is about. So I would say definitely jinn. <laughs> um, the other thing I think that took a, a long time for women to be fully transparent about was the levels of um, violence that they experienced or had experienced in their life. Mm. So sadly, domestic violence, just as it is, you know, pervasive, you know, everywhere was sadly something that was very much part of lots of women's lives there. And that was something that I imagine because of the shame and the stigma surrounding it, took a long time for people to feel comfortable talking to me about and it was one of the hardest things to have conversations about uh, because often I knew the husbands who were involved or the parents-in-law who were involved uh, and had very good relationships with them as well and it's always very challenging to find out something like that about someone that you know and then have to continue to have a working relationship with them. But also on a most sort of basic level, it felt like an amazing privilege to be told those really heartbreaking stories and to be honoured with that trust. And I felt compelled in what I ended up writing about them, both in my thesis and in the book, to be as honest and non-judgmental and non-sensational about what they told me as possible, but also being true to the reality, which is that their lives are very violent a lot of the time. That must have been very difficult to, to listen to. It was. And I would love to say that things, you know, improve and change. But um, I think sadly, you know, it's it's such a pervasive part of culture. And it was something that when I came back to the UK, having finished my field work, I volunteered on the National Domestic Violence Helpline because I'd been so sort of affected by it. And that was another heartbreaking experience, but also one that served as an excellent reminder that it is something that is, you know, it is blind to race, to class, to religion, um, it is something that affects all kinds of people and, uh, yeah, is something that really we need to do more to eradicate. Mm. And just going back to something you said right at the very start, you said that, you know, they're, they're, they're hoping for change for the next generation, for their own children. Do, do you think they're on a path to change? Do you see changes in the, in the near future and in the wider, longer future as well? So I think they're... There is right now, there is capacity for good change and bad change. Mm -hmm. So I think certainly in the last decade, the 
pervasive challenges facing women, not just Muslim women, but women in India have been highlighted both nationally and internationally, sadly, often by awful cases of extreme violence that that have drawn attention to just how difficult it is to be a woman in India. And I think that there are starting to be some changes that will make these girls' daughters' lives better. So one of the most significant in the community that I worked with is the age of marriage. So the legal age is 18. I would say not that is not adhered to as strictly as it should be, but it's certainly there aren't girls where I was working anyway, being married at 12 or 13 anymore. Mm. Yes, it might be happening at 16, 17, but it's not as young as it was. And girls themselves are pushing to stay in school and to complete school and even to go on and study further, which is fantastic. And the government has also become alive to the fact that certainly in West Bengal anyway, that women are such an important voting bloc and there are a range of new schemes, you know, targeting girls to try and encourage them to stay in education and to try and make that beneficial for families to leave their girls in school. So I would really hope that perhaps in a generation from that side of things, things are better. Uh, I think that families are also waking up to the power that girls have to be independent, you know, uh, players in an economic system. And that, you know, in households where women do work, there is an additional income source. And that does make a huge difference when you're, you know, on the poverty line. So from that perspective, I think there could be some really significant changes. I would say on the negative side, Right now in India, the Muslim population is facing a serious crisis with the current BJP administration. Mm -hmm. There have been, since Modi was re-elected in 2019, there have been numerous things from the kind of annexation of Kashmir uh, to the sort of riots that happened in Delhi, where the Muslim community is being targeted and there is some really damaging and worrying rhetoric coming out about the Muslim community in India and whether they belong and whether they have a right to be there. Um, and there are calls from prominent politicians for violence against that community. And I know from the time that I spent with these women, and this was five years ago now, so things have gotten dramatically worse since then that even then it's very hard to imagine and construct a future for yourself when you're worried essentially that you're going to be kicked out of the country that you've been born in and that you love and that you feel like you belong to so from that perspective and just the daily kind of um, prejudice that the Muslim community is facing I think that could pose a real obstacle to any kind of significant change for the future generations of the kind of community that I worked with. Thank you. Thank you, Lexi. I'm not sure whether I just mentioned the full title of the book yet. So, uh, nine Paths, A Year in the Life of an Indian Village. So uh, any listeners that want to find out more or even purchase a book, do you want to give a few more details for us, please? Yep, of course. So uh, you've given the title. Thank you. <laughs> so the book is... Um, it's written in like a narrative nonfiction style. It's based on the research that I did for my PhD, but it hopefully reads more like uh, a novel in that there's no kind of theoretical uh, language or argument made. It's just a pure ethnographic account of nine women's lives. These women span three generations. They are all quite different, but all uh, in my opinion, fascinating. There are some very strong characters and it follows them over the course of 16 months as they navigate, you know, there's all the sort of soap opera drama of a small village. There's marriage, there's death, there's birth, there's affairs, family tensions, spirit possession. Uh, so there's lots going on. And in terms of where you can find it, uh, it is available in most... Uh, online in most bookshops my preferred one is bookshop.org but it's on amazon and waterstones and foils and yeah hopefully some independent bookshops too 
Brilliant. Thank you, Lexi. And if people want to get in touch with you, do you have a, a way they can do that? I do. So I have a website that is imaginatively uh, lexiscadlin.com. <laughs> And there is a form, a contact form on there, uh, which, yeah, goes straight to my email. And I would love to, uh, yeah, hear from anyone who is interested in similar things. Thank you. And you've got um, an online public event, LSE event coming up. Is that right? Yes, I do. So next Monday, the 6th of June uh, at 1 p.m. GMT, I'm going to be part of a discussion. It's chaired by Alpa Shah who's an amazing anthropologist whose book Night March came out a couple of years ago about her time spent with the Maoist revolutionaries in India. And it also features two incredible panellists who have done work. Um, one is a journalist and one is a, an eminent anthropologist who have also worked with women in India. And it's a launch for the book, but it's also a wider panel discussion about what it's like to be a minority woman right now in India. That's brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Lexi. I do really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the podcast. If you would like to contact the show or be interviewed, then please email the Sociology Show podcast at gmail.com.